My name is Athena Kablenu. I'm a stand-up comedian, writer, broadcaster, podcaster. I'm a slashy. That's what they call us in the industry. We do everything to pay our bills. I'm also a parent, which as you will know, if you listen to this podcast, I am loving every minute of, but I crave conversation and I need more words than bubble, duck, and no way um, to form sentences and to have debates, especially in this day and age. So what do I do? I invite a friend around to keep my company. Can't do that though. That's illegal. So what I do is I meet up with somebody virtually online and they come to keep my company. This is a person I've wanted to keep my company for ages. I don't know why it's taken us this long to get together. I think now she doesn't have to leave her house. It's all of a sudden like <laughs> a much a much more attractive proposition. So welcome uh, to my podcast and thank you for keeping my company, Pamela Inchi. Hello. It's Inchi, isn't it? it's Inchi. It's Inchi, right? I learned Sorry? how to say that surname by um, <laughs> reminding myself because when I first met my husband, I said, "Oh, Nikki, that's interesting. Where's that from?" He says, "My name's not Nikki. It's Inchi." And I had to, I had to remind myself how to say it because I was going to talk to his mum. So I taught myself, inchy winchy spider. <laughs> the, the funny thing is, people are always saying to me, "How do you pronounce your surname?" And the funny thing, I say, "Don't apologize," because Ghanaians can't pronounce it. It's not a common <laughs> no. surname. Like we, like they, people always act like having an unpronounceable surname is just weird, kind of thing like yeah you you can come from Ghana and not pronounce a Ghanaian surname it's no. okay to ask how to pronounce it it's it's like if you don't know how to pronounce something just ask it's fine yeah. so Pamela I need to start off by asking how are you these are tumultuous times how are you getting on <laughs> do you know it's it's an interesting question how are you how are you it's very interesting because I always ask people do you really want to know how I am or do you want the say the quick one I've been polite I've asked you um and then we'll move on so if you want a proper how are you, how are you right now? Do you know what? I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm okay. Um, I always say that I've got much to be grateful for because during this period, you know, I'm, I'm remote working. Um, I get the opportunity to, to be safe in my home. I still get the chance to contribute to the work that's going on with coronavirus, but also my normal job. Um, I get to be at home with my favorite people. Um, so in that sense, I'm okay. In that sense, I'm okay. But then there's also the, there's also the, the things that I would like to have done, um, things that I would have liked to, um, to be doing that, that I can't be doing right now. But actually in the grand scheme of things, I think I'm okay. And I think I've probably, this, this period of being at home has been good for me because um, I've been less distracted by all the outside. Yes, how are you? It's, a good, it's an interesting question. So you're okay, but there's all these things happening mm. and things haven't happened. So what kind of things were, were you thinking you would be doing at this time that you're not able to do because of, because of the lockdown and corona? Do you know, um, I had planned, because I'm, I'm a bit of a safe person. I like safety. But this year, I was going to challenge myself to be a little bit more daring. I was going to try and travel to places that aren't just, you know, seaside Spain or seaside Portugal. I was going to try and venture out a little bit. Um, I was going to tag along to um, a friend's sister's wedding just so that I can go to Thailand. Um, because that's, you know, that's something that I would not ordinarily have planned to do. I would have gone to seaside Spain. Um, I was just going to just try and be a bit more daring. Um, and, you know, I can't do that now, but being in lockdown and being in being at home, um, I'm, I'm starting to think about actually what's what's important. Is it necessary for me to be traveling to Thailand or go to remote villages and stuff like that? What is it that I actually want out of life? So my lockdown um, experience has kind of trying to actually get back to the important things for me. It's so easy to be so distracted with various with various things, um, but the lockdown means that I've had to strip all of the unnecessary stuff away um, and just get to what's important to me. And for me, what's important is being with people that I care about, people that I care for. Um, and if I can't be with them physically, finding creative ways to be with them, whether that means sending a care package or, or doing... Um, uh, a, a zoom chat 
so, you know, the things that I didn't want to do, I've now found out actually probably are things that I didn't really need. I just needed to get back to basics of what's important to me. That's a really good point because we often imagine what we think we need to do or have to make our lives better or Mm. happier or more content or more complete. But sometimes those aspirations aren't really based on anything and Mm. there's no rationale to it. Like, why do you need to go to a village in Thailand? I mean, I was going to say go. Like, anyway, but if you you are content with with what you have here and if there are things closer to home to work on, then I Mm. guess you can could save their fare and that that's totally correct um what you were basically doing is prioritizing mm. you know which is great which is really good for your mental health and I think mm. that'd be really good to talk about because I know you do a lot of work in the community and with your friends and wider family and wider family and people wider than that to talk mm. about mental yeah. health um and you do bacon chat sessions I do you do bacon chat shows so where you bake and chat but I don't want to talk about the chat part yet <laughs> The chat stuff's lovely. I want to talk about the bake stuff. Mm, okay. Yes. What do you get from baking? Because you bake a lot. And by the way, I'm waiting for my care package, by the way. You mentioned. Yes. Like, oh, really? Is mine on the way? Is mine on the way? Yes, <laughs> but yeah, you bake. You, you, bake. you, you like, like bake. You, if you if you listen to this and you think you bake, you don't bake. Have <laughs> All right, Pamela is her, is a, is a, a one lady Greg's machine. Oh dear. Um, what's what's baking? What does it mean for you? And what you know? What, what, where does the enjoyment come from? So let's talk about that. So do you know today? I've I've actually had a similar conversation today with a neighbour because I knocked uh, on one of our elderly neighbour. I knocked on his door and then I came bearing um, a chocolate bread log looking thing and scones and coconut biscuits and some yogurt covered raisin cookie thing that I made and he just opened the door and he looked at me and I said um sorry I've been baking again and he just looked at me I went look I have to bake because for me baking is my time out and um, when I'm baking um, I'm not thinking about being a mum I'm not thinking about being a professional I'm not thinking about anything other than um I need to get this set of ingredients to come together um and and it needs to taste good it's my time out I'm not thinking anything higher order. I'm just connecting with dough. Um, it's very therapeutic. Now, some some of us struggle to understand what the word rest is. If you tell me to rest um, and put me in a room with no distraction, I'll sit there um, and I'll start writing my next project or my next um, piece of writing or something that, you know, revolutionary in my head that's going to change humanity I don't know how to just sit still and do nothing when I'm baking it's easier for me because I'm just focusing on just the the kind of the method the process um my mind is absolutely completely blank and it's almost a very you know some people do meditation I suppose mine is baking um and it didn't start off I didn't start off baking to get a therapeutic outcome. I started off baking because I thought that's all mom, what mums did. Um, a few a few years ago, I couldn't bake a fairy cake. And I thought, what a failure. I have a two-year-old um, and, and I can't bake a fairy cake. So I challenged myself to bake a fairy cake for her, for her birthday. And then some crazy idea came into my head and I thought, why don't I try and make her a birthday cake? <laughs> so was that um, a happy birthday or was that a oh uh, it, it's no. it's a birthday <laughs> was that well, a- the mind that I have means that if I put my mind to do something I go all out so I dis- I had about I think I had about five or six weeks before her birthday I baked every single night after work I'll get in the kitchen and I would just try and work out how to put ingredients together. The only problem is I didn't have a weighing scale at the time. I grew up in an African household where if you're being taught to do something, um, you're told, put this amount in. How much? Mm-hmm. Just you know. Or put that amount in. How much do I put, mum? You know when it's enough. I didn't know when it's enough because my cakes came out as butter soup or <laughs> rock. Um, so I decided, okay, all right, I'm going to follow proper procedure. I'm going to buy a weighing scale. 
Where do you buy up class weighing scale from? Poundland. Um, so, so I bought a weighing scale from Poundland. The only problem is it's okay for small little bits, but I'd, I'd created this grand um, image that I'm going to create this wonderful birthday cake. Um, so that one pound scale didn't go that far until my husband says, maybe I'll just help you. And he went and got me no other than a great British Bake Off weighing scale. Oh, wow. This is, I had no idea you owned oh, such a prestigious possession. I do, I do. And I, I didn't know they had their own specific sales. <laughs> you know, I didn't even know they made those things. But I came home one day and he just gave me this weighing scale. And I looked at him thinking, if I didn't love you then, I love you now. And I'm I just. Gonna stop you. I'm going to stop you. Your husband is very clever. Okay. Your husband <laughs> is very clever. He's not stupid. He sees you in the kitchen and he's thinking, hold on a minute. This person wants to bake. I want to eat. Why don't I equip this person with everything she needs to satisfy my bakery needs, right? Then what else did he buy you? Flour, sugar, an apron, <laughs> handcuffs, <laughs> and the chains in the oven. <laughs> you know, or, or, or it could be that he's realized that what I've been giving him as baked goods weren't quite cutting it. <laughs> yeah, he didn't want any more rock cakes. He's like, here, yeah. God, woman, here are some scales. Yeah. <laughs> All jokes aside, that's a really lovely gift. I love thoughtful gifts. I love stuff you get out of surprise. It's really funny. My, there's this on, long-running joke I've got with my partner because he keeps going, I've got a surprise for you. And it's always like some kitchen accessory. <laughs> <laughs> Stop buying me kitchen stuff. It's like, yeah, what it, are you trying to say to me? <laughs> actually, there's, a, there's something about um, what you said that could be true there because we used to, my husband and I used to um, argue a lot when we went shopping about bread bread could have broken our relationship like what, what's the what's the debate <laughs> what was the debate this is this is clean conversation athena um <laughs> so bread um so my husband grew up abroad and there's different you know textures and smells and flavors of bread that is not the same here so we would be in a supermarket we have tried almost every brand of bread my husband will look at it and goes, it has no taste. And I went, what do you mean it has no taste? It tastes like bread. He says, nope, don't like it. And then we'll try another one. Nope, don't like it. Oh, my goodness. I, I even started buying speciality bread. I've tried um, honey and sunflower. I would go to all various shops and he would just look at it, have a taste. And then he would turn up and go, it has no taste. And I'm like, it's bread. What do, you, what do you want it to taste like? So we would stand in the middle of the supermarket and go, look. It's bread. Just choose bread. It's bread. You're not going to get any. It's bread. If you go to Sainsbury's, it will be bread. Tesco, it's bread. And when I managed to crack baking bread at home, we don't argue about bread anymore. That was, that was your marriage counselling. That was it. That was it. That was it. I think because there's a, there's, um, a bread in Ghana called tea bread. It's, it's mm, a bit like yeah. a baguette. And it's not sweet. But now that I bake bread at home, and I have not bought bread for four years. Did you? Sorry, did you just hear that? Did you hear me say that? I've not bought I bread. You, say you haven't bought bread for four years, like some kind. Yeah, like, just, you might like be a hippie and live in the woods and make your own clean electricity. That's incredible. It. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's that's what I'm aspiring to. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've not I have not bought bread for four years, and I I tried um, breads that, that somebody had bought from the shop, and I could instantly understand what my husband was saying about the taste there's it's very very different it it tastes um it tastes more processed <laughs> it tastes a lot more processed the bread, the bread here like we don't really have a great tradition when it comes to our staple foods in the uk we don't we've forgotten like our food culture in in, in britain and for example if you go to france you will never have bread that's over a day old mm. it's just defensive you buy, you buy your bread every day or if you go when I go I get, tend to go to Europe um like a lot it's like common it's not I was saying it like it's a big deal it's not a big deal it's, Euro <laughs> stuff. it's like I'm some big flash person like no, no but what I mean is you know when you go to like a train station and you're in Germany and you buy a sandwich it's the most, the most delicious sandwich you've ever had mm. and when you go and buy a station here in that like, Euston station it literally makes you want to vomit it's just the, like there's a real respect for for food culture mm. and that, that extends to the staples mm. whereas here we don't treat our staples in, in that way i learn a lot through baking i learn about 
how things work. And sometimes I also learn about simplicity. If I try to complicate a recipe, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So, so to be able to bake well, you need to get the basics. You need to know why, why you need that much of yeast or how much baking powder you need or why you need that amount of, of, of butter so that it doesn't come out like cake soup. So once you get the basic, it's, it's very, it, for me, it's very, it's kind of like, um, um, like metaphors, a lot of metaphors in baking. If you get the way that this, the, the, the weights and the measurements wrong, it just doesn't work out. So if a recipe says put 150 grams of, say, butter and you put 120, it be, your dough becomes dry and you can't work with it. Or if it's asked for 150 mils of, of milk or water and you put 300, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And when I'm baking, I'm learning a lot about life lessons. I'm learning a lot about some, you know, sometimes I might be struggling with something, whether it's personal or at work. I start baking and suddenly it clicks into place because the ratios that I'm using in the baking it translates to maybe a ratio I'm using for a strategy. It's really, really strange. I'm, it's I'm not, not strange. Kidding. It's not strange at all. And whilst I have, I'm not qualified to give you this opinion. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you exactly what is happening in in your brain in that moment. So whilst you're baking and you're using precise measurements and you're concentrating um, and you're focusing your mind in the back of your mind, you are mm-hmm. masticating the problem that you have had during the day. And that's kind of um, happening in your subconscious, okay? Mm. So you are distracting yourself so oh, much from that, your problem. You know, you're allowing yourself. coming through. Yeah, right, exactly. It's like, mm. I'll give you an example. Like when I write material, I might spend the morning thinking loads about what I want to say, why I want to say it, uh, my position on the subject, that I'm angry or mad or happy. And I'll be thinking, thinking, thinking. And there might be no jokes. And then what I'll do is I'll take the the baby out for a walk or I'll go for a run or I'll ride my bike. And whilst I'm doing those things that I Mm. enjoy doing, I'm thinking it's in the somewhere Mm. in the the deep recess of my brain, wheels are turning. And then by the time Mm. I get back home and I sit down, I pick up my pen and paper, I'm ready to revisit. Mm. It's almost like defragging your hard drive mm. on your computer. Like you, you do a lot of filing in your brain when when you're distracted, mm. and and the process you just described mm. reminds me exactly mm. of that. I think if you don't walk away from your problems mm. and then revisit them, I think yeah. it can be challenging to to find a solution. Yeah, it's to almost them. it's almost like um, you're trying to fit um, a square into a round object and you're so focused so so intent on shoving this square into this circle that you lose sight of where the circle begins and where the square ends so you're trying to shove the circle um the the square in the circle but actually if you took a step back you realize that the shape of the circle is different from the shape of the square so there's absolutely no way it's going to f- it's going to fit but you're so focused on your end goal that mm. you've lost all, all sense has gone out the window you just need if if you had a hammer you will hammer that um square into that circle but that process of baking you've you've kind of just forgotten you've you've laid it aside forget the square forget the the circle and you're just kind of it's a very calming meditative process what you've described is like a really cool detective show. Like you go to a crime scene and you see all the evidence and you're like, oh my God, there's all this evidence. Blah, 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 blah. You go home, you bake a cake and whilst you're baking the cake, you're solving the mystery. Yep. And then you go out and you find the bad guy. I've just invented Murder, She Baked. That's um, it. There you, you go. Know, you I, copyright it. Copyright Murder, Murder, She Baked. I think that's going to, I think that's going to mean I never have to work again. That's so right. That's I'm, I'm sold. It's going to be bigger than Great British Bake Off. I tell you, I can see it. So is this is this baking as a therapeutic tool for you while you started your bake and chat sessions? Well, the actual it didn't it wasn't even the the therapeutic thing that I started bake and chat. I realized that as people, especially as people of, you know, as coming from a culture where food is central to a lot of our our celebrations or gathering, I realized that 
when we are with friends or if you go out, you know, girls night out and, or you go for a girls dinner or, you know, friends, friends dinner, whatever you, you do with your friends, when you go out, you're sitting around the table, conversations evolve quite naturally. And there's something quite therapeutic about sharing around the table. If you have a dinner party, the conversation will get deep at some point. So food was quite, um, it, it's kind of a, a leveler and also it brings people together. It's almost like your guard is down. And then you connect it with the kind of distraction that doing something brings. When you're focusing on an activity, you're not worried about your problems, you, you think clearly. So if I can bring the thinking clearly elements that I I experience myself through baking and then the food elements, the sharing elements of um, when we're together around the table. If I can combine the two, I can get people to be distracted by doing something with their hands. And afterwards, there's that. Um, so at every baking chat at the end, it's, a, it's like a tea party. With proper, with proper tea, you know, tea, I say tea equipment, with proper china, um, pastry forks, a proper dinner, uh, did I say dinner party, a proper tea party at the end of every bacon chat. And it's a time where um, I was throwing certain questions depending on the theme of the bacon chat. So um, the first one this year was looking at um, kind of planning for the year ahead and checking in on yourself. How are you doing? Uh, where have you come from? Where are you trying to get to? So I would, throughout the baking process, I would I would kind of do a pit stop. I call it a pit stop. And then I would throw in a question. And they, through that, through the period of the baking, they'll be thinking about the question. So by the end of the baking process, when we sit down together, I will ask the, 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 audio, the audience, the participants, um, how they felt about the questions or things that they observed when they were baking. So, you know, if you've got somebody who's never baked before, and I'll say, when I presented you the recipe, what did you think? And then somebody will say, I panicked. I thought, what's this? You know, what's an ML? And what's T? What's the difference between TBSP and TS? And it was just utter confusion. And then I'll say, sometimes life can be an utter confusion. And then I will ask the next question. How did you manage then to get through the recipe if you thought it was out of confusion. And then, the you know, the participant will say something like, well, I asked somebody who seemed to be, you know, working through this quite easily. Or I asked you as the person who gave me that recipe. And I said, these are significant skills that we need to develop. We need to develop, go back to basic and develop the skill of asking. Asking clever questions and also sometimes asking basic questions. I've presented you a, men, um, a recipe. You don't know what you're doing. Ask, you know, mm. how do I do it? And sometimes we're, again, we're so busy. Life can be so fast paced that we, we're thrown into the deep end and we just try and just muddle through. But sometimes there are pit stop opportunities to ask. And I think sometimes we forget that, especially for, for some of us who may have grown up quite independent or some of us who may have jobs where you're required to think on your feet quite quickly. Or it might be that we might be in competitive environments where you don't want to appear to be a novice or appear to be um, unskilled and asking might look as if you're, you know, you don't know what you're doing, but actually asking and just stopping before you start some of us start before we've even engaged our brain um stop ask get your mind together get your um it's almost like your roadmap you start to build your roadmap so the through baking we're able to kind of get back to basics of picking up essential life skills and this is all through baking <laughs> this is all through baking <laughs> because it's it's almost like your guard is down. You're doing something. There's a lot of giggles, so, but it's not all, you know, it's not all intense because you turn up, you get your apron, you get a whole heap of um, um, ingredients. Every ingredients you need will be on the table, but they will not be sorted out for you because life is not sorted out for you. You've got to pick and choose your ingredients to make whatever it is that you're destination is so i will give them a menu for the 
um, tea party that will be at the end. I will say this is what we're having for starter for all our main course. Or I will say that you know these are the pastries we're going to make. These are the cakes we're going to make. Ingredients are there. Here's your recipe. Get on with it. And they will look at me. <laughs> they'll look at me <laughs> and then and then the journey the journey to self-discovery begins that's right. like that's that's how it works absolutely in terms of like mental health and and mental well-being do you think that um black women have neglected their their well-being in terms of their mental health for maybe other things and I asked this question because it's really interesting at the moment with the whole you know as we record this like you go online everyone's saying black lives matter Mm. and and Mm. whatever there's a lot of um sort of black women fighting for black men and there's a lot of it's quite stressful being online at the moment because everyone is tagging you in this is really racist have you seen it and all this stuff um and it feels like there's a lot of kind of strong black woman rhetoric going out there. Mm. And do you think that this is something that we we need to address, especially now we're in a period of time where we have futures that are more uncertain than ever? It's a it's a it's a very t- uh, important question, especially at, especially also at this time during coronavirus, where um, a lot of people are have been forced to change and adapt very, very quickly to a very uncertain environment. So we're dealing with a pandemic. We're also dealing with, you know, this this new um, opportunity to make a difference in terms of the racial dialogue, um, in terms of respond to um, all the, the, the various, oh gosh, I can't tell you how many webinars and Zoom meetings and Skype this. There are, there's a, there's a, overload and overload of opportunity and overload of information and you know are black women neglecting their mental health or have black women's mental health been neglected during this period um i I think there is something about black women as as a gender as a culture as individuals, we hold so many hats, just like every other woman, we hold so many hats, but we're doing that in an environment where, where it's quite uncertain. And what's interesting is that the, you know, the murder of, um, I say brother Floyd, because he's a brother, um, has opened up a lot of people's perhaps people's experience, past experiences of their own um, exp- uh, racial experiences. So, so for example, you know, you might get tagged into a message and suddenly it reminds you of an experience that you, ex- you know, you, you encountered. Um, and it will bring, it will bring up for a lot of women unresolved issues and it will bring for a lot of women anger. But when you go deep into it, you're thinking, why are you so angry? And you say, I'm angry because that should not have happened to that person. Why should that? There's a lot of that should not happen. Why Why must it be, be us? And there's, a, you know, lots of hashtag going, enough is enough. So when you raise the question about black women neglecting, it's almost like enough is enough. There's that enough is enough. What is this neglect? Is this is this a, a childhood thing? Is this a, something that we've missed? We we've missed in educating our black girls in the beginning to be prepared for adult life. There's an that that word neglect can take us into so many different avenues. But what that tells me is that as a as a community or as a society, we have failed to prepare our Afro Caribbean children into the reality that they're going to live in. And I say this because um, this period of time, especially with the Black Lives Matter um, discussions that's coming at the moment, um, it, it, it reminded me of um, a time when, gosh, how long ago was this now? This is probably t- uh, just, yeah, about 10 or so years ago. Um, you know, minding my own business. I've just, I'm coming back from Brussels. I've never been on a ferry before. So friends, um, a couple of friends of, um, of mine, we went to Brussels, but we went on the 
on a ferry. We've now come back. Going out the country was no problem. You know, we just go about our business. We're coming back and we're now stuck in Dover for four hours. Why are we stuck in Dover for four hours? Because we were told we're doing routine checks. Um, so I stand by the car that we're driving, a Ferrari. Um, there's three of us, two females and a male. The male um, black guy was the driver. And suddenly we're being called into what looked like an empty warehouse. Um, and we're told that it's a routine check. And then we're being asked questions as, you know, where have you come from? Uh, Brussels, that's where the ferry came from. Um, and then we're being asked to give evidence of where we stayed. And then my friend asks, you know, why are you asking us these questions? And then the, just that you can, you can tell the anger that came upon this immigration officer because a black man has asked him a question. Why are you asking what hotel we've stayed in? That's how it all started that led us to be in Dover for four hours. So, um, he then, I think it, the whole thing was just, it was just the most bizarre. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. And I stood there watching everything happen. And then as my friend is trying to ascertain why um, we need to show evidence of what hotel we've been staying at, I'm watching other cars that are being um, directed into the same warehouse that we're waiting in. And all those cars are full of black people. Mm. So then I ask one of the officers standing by, um, can I ask, what is the purpose? What is the reason for us being here? She said, oh, um, routine check. And then I asked the question, I said, is it routine that every car that has black people comes into the warehouse? And she looked at me quite blankly. And I remember this conversation because it's not a conversation I've ever had in my life. Um, and then she says, oh, it's routine check. We're just, you know, every so often we'll ask um, a car to come in and we'll just have conversations with them. And I said, but actually what I've noticed that there's a similarity in every single car you've pulled up. Every single car has black people in them. Can I ask why that is routine? And she says, oh, um, um, and she just kept saying, um, um, um. And I said, because you stopped me and my friends. We're a car full of black people. The car which is right next to us now is also a car full of black people. You stopped another set of black people. Can I ask why this is a routine check? Because it does not appear to me to be routine if you are picking on the same demographic of people. And then she says, um, well, um, uh, I, I, it's, it's just one of the things that we do. And I said, well, it doesn't then appear to me as routine because clearly you are selecting specific groups of people and calling it routine. That to me does not sound routine. And then I said, um, I need a written explanation. Um, and then she said, um, hold on, sorry, she walked away and then called another member of um, staff to come and speak with me. You know, and then I just thought, oh, they're going to do good cop, bad cop, because the next one came. Hello, how are you? Where have you just? And I just thought, no, 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 no. I've just asked somebody for information, and that information is not, you know, I'm waiting for it. Um, and then it just, it just a whole heap of muddle. So then I decided to think, okay, if you want to play an official game, I would also like to play an official game. I said I would like a your written complaints policy because I need to know who I'm going to be addressing my complaints to. I do not understand why I've been here for four hours. You're telling me this is routine and there's cars being pulled out full of black people. Um, and then she says, oh, if you go online, you'll find. I said, no, you have to provide for me a written policy um, or at least uh, you have to give me written information so that I know where I'm going. Um, okay, well, I'll find you something. So I think what she had done was she found me a, a, a business card. Um, and then I said, um, I need your name. So I know um, who I am addressing my complaints to and who I'm addressing my complaints about. And then she just covered her name badge with her hand. And I went, I went, but if you don't tell me, how am I going to? Uh, who, who, uh, and she says, "Well, I can give you my my number. I just can't give you my name." So on the badge that you're wearing. Uh, this was this was gosh, huh? yeah, this was about 
10, this was about 10 years ago. This was about Let 10 years ago. tell you right now, though, whoever was <laughs> organizing or whoever was responsible for that was, has put Black Lives Matter on their Twitter feed, you know, <laughs> They've, they've done oh. Blackout Tuesday. And this is what people don't get. We have a lifetime of this. You can tell every mm. African or African descended person has a story. I saw um, a word um, that was used today for the first time. I've never heard it before. Afrophobia. Oh. Isn't that interesting? And I never thought, what, um, what, a, what a good word to describe the way African and African descended people mm. are, are treated. There's just a, a really bizarre and an unreasonable and unfathomable fear of black people. Mm. But not only that, people in that position who want to abuse their authority, mm. they know they can abuse their authority against black people because they mm. will be forgiven. Whereas mm. any other, anyone else, their bosses might not approve of it. But because mm. there was a genuine, um, I don't know what you can call it, a dislike or a distrust or a genuine conscious or subconscious belief that white people are better than black people people who are on power trip or the kind of people that there's a minority of people who who like telling other people what to do so they get these kind of jobs in these kind of official environments and they know they can mm. abuse that power um and use black mm. people to do that and she can cover up her name badge she'd be like yeah write to my boss and she'll just and the, my boss will protect me you know, right. but you know, you know what? I think what what was different in this case is that I didn't accept that. I didn't accept that as a as a, as a good enough response. And I think one of the challenges, and again, I can't speak for all black people, but one of the challenges is that we don't challenge enough. It's exhausting. That's we why. don't challenge because if we challenge every time this happens, it gets mm. it gets tiring. And then what happens is something. There's a big flashpoint. So, for example, with George Floyd, you know, and it all comes pouring out in our testimonies. But you see, that, that's where some of the challenges are because we don't challenge it. Um, it's almost like it becomes okay. Well, I'm not saying it's okay; it's never okay. But it sends the message that we can get away with it, mm -hmm. so we'll keep doing it. The other reason, now, oh, sorry, just, sorry to interrupt, but the other reason is it's like we don't think it will help. Like nothing will change. My experience in Dover changed the way I essentially changed me as a person. For the first time in my life, I was faced with, I'm black. <laughs> I'm black. It sounds so bizarre. For the first time I went, oh my goodness, I'm black. <laughs> I, I mean, I knew that growing up. I mean, I, you know, my mother's gone in, my father's gone in. I grew up. In East London, my house inside my house is Ghana, and then when you leave your house, then you're in England. Everything in the house was Ghana. We had Ghanaian food. Uh, my mum spoke Ghanaian language to us, and we responded in English. But apart everything, it's almost like our house could have been lifted into Ghana and would still be existing in the same way. But once we open the front door, we're in England again, and for the first time in my life, in my late twenties, for the first time. The, it's like the penny dropped. And I say this because I remember when um, when I was at school, there were things that happened and my mom would say, see, it's because you're black. And I'd be thinking, mom, come on, man. It's okay. Mom, we're in, you know, it's fine. We've moved on from that now. You know, slavery is finished. It's okay, mom, calm down. But that day in Dover, everything my mom said suddenly made sense to me. Yeah, I suddenly came to understand why certain teachers behaved the way they did to me. I suddenly realized why when I would go home and say what had happened at home, my mom would say, it's because you're black. Don't let them get away. When you go back, I want you to stand up for yourself. But I used to think my mom was, I'm like, mom, it's okay. It's okay. So like she's always pouted. It's okay. But that day in Dover made me understand exactly uh, almost all the experiences that my mum responded with is because you're black. I, it, it just, it never occurred to me. Yes, yes, I'm, I see my skin, nice chocolate skin. Yes, I see that cocoa butter glistening, all of that. I see shea butter, all of that on my skin. However, it never occurred to me that I was different until that day in Dover. And I concluded my my visit or my, my forced stay in Dover. I, 
I saw my body in skeleton mode. I had to go for a body scan, like a like I was I felt very criminalized. And I left the the last the last remark I left with the immigration officers is that this being here for four hours, what you have told me is no matter how hard that I work, no matter how much I give back to my community, because I tell you, I spent a lot of my teenage years doing voluntary work. I I pushed in my education. I educated myself as much as I can because I want options in life. I want to be able to pick and choose what job I had. I was quite naive in some ways because I thought if I overqualified myself, I can pick and choose what I like and then I can get any job I like if I want it, blah, blah, blah. But standing here in Dover, what you've told me is that it doesn't matter what qualifications I have. It doesn't matter how much I give back to my community. It doesn't matter, you know, how well I present myself. All you see is a guilty black person before I have even opened my mouth. You picked us up in a car. You have made us stay here for four hours in Dover. Because of routine check, I have gone through body scan. You have um, ultraviolet checked our car because my friend asked the question, why do you need to know what hotel we came from? What you're telling me is that I can do all the right things, but what you see in me is a guilty person, somebody who is capable of all sorts of things. You don't see me as a potential or an upright citizen or any, you see nothing other than target or potential criminal or whatever. You know nothing about me, but the fact that my skin is brown gives you the permission to subject me to this experience. You don't know nothing about me. That's at the heart of of two things. First of all, our naivety. Mm. So a lot of us, we not just yourself, for generations, we've come to this country, changing our names, we've been marrying British people, we've been putting our feet under the table and we thought that was all okay. And then when we got letters from immigration, we were like, doesn't matter, we've been here for 40 years, doesn't matter, you know, and, and, and we're getting a rude awakening. The second thing is, really, you said that's the time you realised you were black. I'm going to disagree with that. Ooh. I'm going to say that's the first time you realised white people were mad. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not... That's not the issue. We know we're African. We know where we come from. We're proud of it. But what we realize is other people have got a problem with that. You know? And that's, I think that's, that's what we lose. We lose that, that, yeah. that, that privilege of existing mm, without constantly yes. knowing that we're being judged. Whereas if you're white, you have a race, but you get to pretend you don't have a race. Whereas we don't get to pretend that. So I'll always say, I've always known I was mm. black, but I definitely got my realization that, oh, I'm black, but white people are mad. <laughs> no, like, do you know, you said generally they're mad <laughs> do you know you said something really important there it's the the privilege there's yeah. this privilege of it's like you being and again I'm, I'm going i'm going to come back to what you asked about the mental health bit and if you've got somebody that's always having to consciously be aware it's almost like be on guard you're always on guard you're always having to check yourself how the heck do you expect somebody to be their authentic self when they are always having to check themselves how can you expect somebody to live their best possible life and feel well be well mentally if they are always whether consciously or subconsciously afraid of a repercussion. Now, if I am, I'm just going to give a scenario here. I am at a duty-free um, shop in Spain. I should not worry that a security guard is suddenly looking at me from the time I enter the shop and following me. That should, if, if there was no issue racially, that should not happen. I should be able to walk into the shop, touch whatever I like. If I don't want to buy, I'll put it back and walk out. As a black person in Spain, duty free, I'm, I'm making it so obvious <laughs> that I'm touching something and I'm putting it back. It's almost like hands up. It's not going in my pocket. It's not going in my bag because from the time I enter the shop, I could feel eyes on me. I could feel my, my movements being monitored. By security. Now, is that because I am paranoid 
or is that because of lived experience? Now, if you have a people, a group of people who are always feeling under scrutiny, that is going to not be conducive to their mental health. It's not going to be conducive to their aspirations because, you know, after it's like, what's the point? I can, you know, that conversation or that conclusion I left with the, um, the, the, the immigration officer at Dover was, it does not matter how qualified or how overqualified I am. It does not matter how I give to my society. When you see me, you see me as target or you see me as a suspect or you see me as something that has not even entered my own mind. It, mm. it, but, but, but always, you're always almost on guard checking yourself. If I go to Nando's, if I go to Marks and Spencer's, I'm always weary that there's probably security watching my every mood in case I'm going to, I'm going to smuggle a cucumber in my bag or something because of the lived experience. It impacts the decisions you make. It, it, it affects where you want to socialize. It affects the people you want to socialize with. So we're talking about, you know, you, your question was about black women neglecting their mental health or mental health being neglected. There's so many other things going on in the background it's a good point because the conversation about mental health and and well-being mm. doesn't ass- assumes that people don't have better things to talk about but on, on that note I want to I want to ask you a, like a final a final question um and that's about post lockdown things will change. I don't think we'll go back to the old way because for lots of reasons, it worked. Corona's not going anywhere. We don't have a vaccine um, jobs. I can't, you know, I can't go out to stand up. Lots of people who had particular jobs can't go back to them, so on and, and so forth. What positives can you take from what the world might look like? Depending on your level of resilience, some people are so used to adversity and reinventing themselves and kind of like, you know, going with the punches, that they're able to adapt. They come out of post-lockdown either unaffected or, you know, that was another issue I had to deal with, deal with it next, that kind of thing. But then you've got others who um, were potentially at the brink of, of a breakdown. And, you know, being in a lockdown situation, it's almost like, um, almost like this confinement. Um, If you feel that you've been, you've not been in control during this period of time, where you're not in control of how you live your life, you're not in control of where you shop or how you shop, you're not in control of what you do on a day-to-day basis, that is going to affect people's um, ability to readapt when um, lockdown ceases. The pos- there, there are positives in the period that some people would have had to have been resilient and built up their resilience quite quickly. But unfortunately, there will be another group of people for whom um, this period mentally would have been a significant strain that we need to start preparing for, um, for an increase in cases. We need to start preparing our services to be able to take on more people and deal with more diverse needs. We know that a lot of people have been um, affected, either bereaved or affected by, you know, um, the the narrative of death um, in the media. People would have lost loved ones. All of this is going to affect how people adjust post lockdown. The, 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 The only thing I can say to those people is that ask for help. And it goes back to the whole um bacon chat thing the basic thing we seem to forget in life is about the asking ask for help um if you're not sleeping because you're worrying about something if you're not eating because you're worrying about something if there's been a change in your routine and you just can't seem to adapt think think about think about asking for help um either through friends you know or through families um if you're connected to um, a group, ask for help, you know, speak out, don't, don't suffer in silence, silence and, um, sometimes can escalate things and heighten things. Um, think about a child that's scared of the dark, 
you know, everything becomes monstrous. You know, if you hear a door creak open, it becomes bigger and louder than it is. But actually, when you voice it out, when you find um, the right person to speak with, whether it's a family friend or whether it's a family member or or whether it's a professional in some cases, it kind of brings perspective back. And services, mental health services, are gearing themselves up to have more and more um, conversations with people about anxiety, about depression, and about all those kind of stuff. So there are great things that we've learned about ourselves during coronavirus, which is a positive in the sense that some of us are able to actually identify what's the most, what's the important things in life. It's not about the traveling to Thailand and doing great and wonderful excursions or going to Michelin star restaurants. Um, it's about the basic things. It's about getting our basic needs right, having, um, you know, addressing our safety issues, um, spending time with loved ones, feeling connected. The basic things um, is probably the positives that is going to come out of coronavirus. But we also have to be mindful that there are going to be people who are who have been very, very badly affected by this period of lockdown, um, either because they lived by themselves or that they lived with um I don't know, they lived with people that perhaps they were struggling with before coronavirus and they're almost being mm. forced, being forced to stay in constant presence of those people. We know that things like, you know, domestic violence and uh, you asked about positive. So I'm going to try and stay on positive. Positive is we're probably more aware of what's important in life. Yes, I think I think we are. Um we're, and you certainly are because you're spending time with your friends and baking for them, which yes. I thoroughly recommend all of my friends do. Start baking and um, send them to me. Send the cakes. <laughs> send the cakes to me. I have to apologise. Normally, as you know, people come round to my house to keep my company, and they get a big, massive plate of plantain. I have heard about this plantain. Food. I yeah, have, I know. It's, it's 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 what happens. And I would have gone that, gone out, pushed the boat out for you. I'd have done a little extra for you, you oh, know. Yeah. So when this is, when this is over, um, you have an invitation to come round again, and and, and we, you've got a, basically a plantain voucher. Oh, this is what wonderful. this is. This is a plantain voucher. Knock on the door. <laughs> show me this podcast, and I'll be like, yeah, yeah, of course, because I owe you some plantain, and I'm going to fill up your plate, and it will be it will be great, and and it will be long overdue because this lockdown has been gone gone on for too long all right Pamela I'm gonna to have to wrap this up because uh, this is really super long you've been fantastic this has been so insightful and it's given me food for thought um thank you for coming to keep my company thank you for having me <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome that was Pamela Inchi an academic a lecturer um, expert in public health and perhaps most importantly an, a master baker honestly her bread is delicious she would cross a very busy road to get to that bread oh it's, she's she's really talented and to learn it so quickly as well anyway she's great um thank you so much again Pamela for coming onto the podcast um you've been waiting for ages but all things happen at the right time they're supposed to happen and what a time to get a, an expert in psychology and public health and somebody so thoughtful onto the podcast to talk about these things which are sometimes exhausting to talk about but at the same time these are great conversations to have at, at this moment in time almost cathartic so I, I I really appreciated that conversation and I hope you did too thank you to you for listening I hope you did enjoy it and if you did please share the podcast uh, whatever platform you're using probably has some kind of star rating or you can like it leave a comment if you want and if you want you can find me my name's Athena Kablenu I'm a stand-up comedian writer podcaster broadcaster all kinds of things and you can just find me on Instagram Facebook and Twitter where I currently reside thank you so much again for listening and we'll catch up next time <laughs>